Hi everyone, this lesson is on the obstetrical condition known as placenta previa. In this lesson, we're going to talk about what this condition is. We're also going to talk about the risk factors for getting this condition. We'll also talk about the signs and symptoms, how clinicians diagnose it, and how they treat it. So placenta previa is an obstetrical condition involving implantation of the placenta near or over the internal cervical opening, which is also known as the internal cervical os. So within the uterus, when the placenta has formed, it implants into the endometrium of the uterus. If the implantation of the placenta is too close to the internal opening of the cervix, this can lead to placenta previa. So if the placenta implants too close to the internal cervical os, it can either lead to a partial or complete covering of the internal cervical os, and that can lead to problems we're gonna talk about in this lesson. So here is another image. This is the uterus here. The lining of the uterus is the endometrium, and then the opening into the uterus is from the cervix. So the cervix is here. There is internal cervical os and then the external cervical os. Now, the etiology of this condition is actually unknown, but it is believed to be due to uterine scarring. And as we will see, there are certain risk factors that are associated with uterine scarring that increase the risk for getting placenta previa. What is the epidemiology of this condition? It occurs in approximately two to three out of 1,000 pregnancies. And the clinical manifestation of placenta previa is vaginal bleeding. And this vaginal bleeding tends to occur around the 30th week of gestation. But vaginal bleeding can occur anywhere in the second or third trimester. Now let's talk about the risk factors for actually getting placenta previa. So the risk factors include increasing maternal age, the reason increasing maternal age is a risk factor for getting placenta previa is because as a patient gets older, they're more likely to have had some of these other risk factors we're going to talk about in a moment. Another risk factor is multiple gestation. So multiple gestation is where there is more than one fetus, so it could be a twin pregnancy or a triplet pregnancy. And the reason that this is going to be a risk factor is because there's just not going to be enough space for a placenta to implant. So it may actually implant too close to the internal cervical os or the internal cervical opening. Another risk factor is multiparity. Multiparity is having many children. So this can tie in with the increasing maternal age. The use of certain substances is also another risk factor for getting placenta previous includes smoking and illicit drug use like cocaine use. Prior obstetrical surgeries can also increase the risk for getting placenta previa. So again, this is going to tie in with that proposed etiology. If a patient has had a dilatation in curatage or DNC or a previous C-section, which both can lead to scarring of the uterus, this is a risk factor for placenta previa. So you can imagine that if there is scarring in the uterus, the placenta is not going to attach to that scarred area. It's going to attach to another area of the uterus. So if there is scarred area, it's more likely or the chances are higher that the placenta may attach closer to the internal cervical os. And this prior obstetrical surgery as a risk factor is associated with that increased maternal age because as a patient gets older, they're more likely to have had an obstetrical surgery. And then as with many things in medicine, a past history of a particular condition or event is going to be a risk factor for it happening again in the future. So a prior history of placenta previa is another risk factor for getting placenta previa in the future. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of placenta previa. The most significant and most important sign of placenta previa is vaginal bleeding. Now it's important to recognize that this vaginal bleeding is painless and it's going to be bright red in coloration. So you can see in this image here, if the placenta is overlying or overlapping or even partially overlapping the cervical os, there can be bleeding from the placenta and this can manifest as vaginal bleeding. And then oftentimes what's going to be noted is there's going to be recurrent episodes of vaginal bleeding. And then depending on the degree of placenta previa, depending on the placental placement, if it's partially or completely overlapped, that's going to determine when the earliest onset of vaginal bleeding is going to occur in placenta previa. And the bleeding from placenta previa may stop spontaneously, although it may not, and it may become severe requiring intervention. We're going to talk about some of those interventions in a moment. Now, it's important to note that vaginal bleeding can be due to a variety of different obstetrical conditions. One of them is placenta previa. Another one is vasa previa, as we talk about in another lesson. And another one is abruptio placentae, or a placental abruption. And all of these are going to have different clinical manifestations. So 
If you want more information on those topics, please check out my full lessons on those topics. Now, what's important to note with a placenta previa vaginal bleed is that the fetal heart rate is often normal. Now, with vasa previa, we're going to see fetal heart rates being abnormal, and oftentimes the fetus is going to be in distress. So this is going to be a difference with the clinical presentation here. And then on physical examination, the uterus is often going to be tender and normal. Now, having said all that, there are complications of placenta previa. We're going to separate them depending on maternal complications and fetal complications. Now, some maternal complications include anemia. So the bleeding from the placenta itself oftentimes can be maternal in origin. So it can lead to a maternal anemia or a maternal low red blood cell count. After delivery of the baby, there can be postpartum hemorrhage. This can be more likely to occur in patients with placenta previa. With blood loss, especially with large amounts of blood loss, this can lead to hypovolemic shock. So hypovolemic shock, hypo meaning low or low, volemic referring to the volume, blood volume more specifically, so low blood volume. So shock due to low blood volume, that can occur as a maternal complication. That can be a very significant complication. And then overall, there can be increased maternal morbidity mortality. And then there's increased risk of maternal placenta accreta spectrum, or PAS. So placenta accreta spectrum conditions are conditions that can more likely occur in patients who have had a previous placenta previa. So these conditions can also occur later in other pregnancies in patients who have had placenta previa. And then there are a set of fetal complications as well. One of them is going to be preterm premature rupture of membranes or PPROM. Another one is risk or an increased risk of prematurity. So increased risk of prematurity, meaning that a baby is more likely to be a preemie or more likely to be delivered prior to 37 weeks of gestational age. There can be increased fetal morbidity mortality as well. There can be intrauterine growth restriction. There can be intrauterine hypoxia, so reduced oxygen levels within the uterus. And then there can be malpresentation. So the baby can present more often as a breech presentation. So these can all be complications with regards to the fetus. Now let's talk about the diagnosis and treatment of placenta previa. So the diagnosis often is going to involve transvaginal ultrasound or sonography. A transabdominal ultrasound can be performed, but oftentimes it's going to miss or not pick up the placenta previa. Now, the transvaginal ultrasound oftentimes is performed around 18 to 20 weeks of gestation. And what is defined as placenta previa is where the edge of the placenta is within 20 millimeters or 2 centimeters of the internal cervical os. That is going to be important measurements to remember with regards to how close the placenta has to be in order to be considered placenta previa. And it may not only be this close to the internal cervical loss, it may actually be even closer to that or even overlap the internal cervical loss. And that will be measured differently. It'll be measured as a certain number of millimeters overlap. And then there are a few different categories of how placenta previa is diagnosed. If it is close within this range of the internal cervical os or that internal cervical opening, but not overlapping it, it would be considered low-lying. If it is slightly overlapping it, but not completely overlapping it, it would be considered marginal. If it is completely overlapping the internal cervical opening, that would be a complete placenta previa. And then if it's not diagnosed this way, it can often be diagnosed as a clinical diagnosis. So if there's vaginal bleeding, if there has been other tests performed to rule out some of those other causes of vaginal bleeding. This may be thought to be placenta previa. And then how do clinicians treat this condition? So clinicians will often wait for this condition as gestational age increases. So 90% will oftentimes resolve spontaneously with increasing gestational age. As the baby grows, the uterus will also grow. And then the Proximity of the placenta and the internal cervical os may actually spread out. So the distance from the edge of the placenta may actually move away from the internal cervical os with that growing or expanding uterus. However, if during early ultrasounds, it was found that there was complete overlap of the placenta, it's unlikely that this will resolve on its own. So if the edge of the placenta is within that range we talked about before, if it's right on that edge of the range, it's more likely that it's going to resolve spontaneously. If it is overlapping the internal cervical opening, it's less likely to resolve as gestational age increases.
Now, because there can be some mixing of blood, it's important to provide Rogram if the mother is Rh negative. And then in some cases, if there's a lot of blood loss, blood transfusion may be required. And in some circumstances, if there is a very severe postpartum hemorrhage, a hysterectomy may also be required as well in order to completely stop the bleeding. And in some cases, a C-section delivery may be required if the placenta previa has not spontaneously resolved with increasing gestational age. You can imagine that if the placenta is overlying the internal cervical opening, the baby actually can't be delivered. So a C-section will be required in order to deliver the baby. So if you want to learn more about other obstetrical conditions, please check out my obstetrical playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.